I'm a geek, and I like to learn from books I read, even if they're fiction. And I've learned more from Neil Stevenson's books than I ever did in any class. I learned about Sumerian culture from Snow Crash. I learned about the war in the Pacific from Cryptonomicon. I learned about the beginnings of banking from the Baroque cycle. And there were also Diamond Age, Zodiac, Anathem, RIMD, essays, articles, and a number of transmedia projects. And now there's his latest book, Seven Eves. But much like learning from the young ladies illustrated primary in Diamond Age, uh, learning from Neil's books was never boring because they had great stories, great characters, and great humor. Uh, Neil's books expanded and challenged my mind. I've been a bookseller for four years now, and yet almost every week I put a copy of Snow Crash into someone's hands because I want them to read these books and to enjoy them as much as I have, which is why it is my immense honor and pleasure to ask you to please join me in welcoming Neil Stevenson. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, warm welcome, and thanks, Anton, for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, <clears throat> my voice is trashed because I have a cold, and I did 21 radio interviews today. <laughs> so bear with me. <clears throat> the moment of silence may extend beyond its original <laughs> plan. Um, when I was a kid, uh, growing up in Iowa, I used to ride my a bike to the bookmobile every week and uh, check out whatever the latest science fiction book was. And at some point I read a book whose uh, title and author I've unfortunately forgotten that was a space arc book. It, it can, talked about a global catastrophe that obliged the people of Earth to make an arc and go into space in a giant rocket and try to preserve civilization. And um, it must have made a big impression on me because now I have written one and it just came out a week ago today. Um, the, uh, it took me a while to uh, make my contribution to the space arc subgenre because it turns out that to write one of these you have to come up with an incredibly finely calibrated disaster scenario. So if an asteroid comes out of nowhere tomorrow and destroys the world, um, I can't make a space arc book out of that because there's not enough time to build an arc. But if it's a slow rolling kind of disaster that takes hundreds of years to materialize, then we probably wouldn't build an arc, we'd do something else to, to solve the, the problem. So, so it's gotta be a, a disaster that kills everyone predictably in a fixed period of time that's pretty, <laughs> on a fairly short time scale. Uh, and um, the, uh, my opportunity came uh, about 10 years ago when I was working at Blue Origin, which is a space, private space uh, company in Seattle, and uh, happened to read a paper about the problem of space junk or space debris. So uh, we've been going into space for long enough now that we've littered low Earth orbit with spent uh, boosters and, or not boosters, but spent upper stages and uh, uh, dead satellites and um, the things that astronauts dropped on their spacewalks. And they're all zooming around up there uh, in, at incredibly high velocities. And from time to time, two of them at random will bang into each other. And um, when that happens, they'll shatter and produce more fragments that'll go spraying out in different orbits. And some of them enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up, but most of them stay up there and are eligible for more collisions. So the specter has been raised by space scientists that this could snowball. It could produce a chain reaction in which uh, so many pieces of fine debris were generated over a short period of time that space would be closed to us. We wouldn't be able to safely go up there in the way that we've grown accustomed to. So as far as the company was concerned, um, that was a purely academic point, but the novelist in me thought, okay, well, this, this might be something I could use, but it would have to be on a much bigger scale if it's going to kill everyone. Um, so... Um, I, was, I finally figured out a way to use it by, by blowing up the moon, which is what happens on the first sentence of the first page of this book. So the moon, for some reason that's never explained, breaks up into seven large pieces. <laughs> and um, 
Um, the, uh, there's a character uh, in the book, one of the main characters is uh, a guy named Dubois Jerome Xavier Harris, who's an astrophysicist at Caltech, but he's also a science popularizer. He's one of these guys who goes on to the Today Show to explain things that are happening in science. And so his phone rings when the moon blows up. And um, he, Dube is his sort of informal nickname, but Dr. Harris is, is what he's called in academic settings. Uh, he uh, gets busy trying to kind of uh, explain this to the extent it can be explained and to try to calm people down and get people interested in it more as a scientific phenomenon and less as a terrifying disaster. So one of the things he does is to give the seven pieces of the moon kind of funny names. So he calls them, he doesn't want to call them Nemesis or Thor or anything like that. So he, he calls them Potato Head, Mr. Spinney, Acorn, Peach Pit, Scoop, Big Boy, and Kidney Bean. And um, that works for a while until uh, about a week later, um, one of the, two of the pieces collide and Kidney Bean breaks in half. So now there's eight pieces instead of seven. And the scientist in him asks if we can go from seven to eight, could we go from eight to nine, then nine to 10, and how long would it take and what would be the the consequences. So we uh, rejoin the action a few days after that, after he's had time to make some calculations. He's at Camp David with the president and some other important people. And um, the uh, so my friend and colleague Bruce Sterling once said that a thriller is a science fiction novel that includes the president of the United States. <laughs> so. So this is where it turns into a thriller. Um, <laughs> we need to stop asking ourselves what happened and start talking about what is going to happen, Dr. Harris said to the President of the United States, her science advisor, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and about half of the Cabinet. You can see that the President didn't like that. Julia Bliss Flaherty currently nearing the end of her first year on that job. The chairman of the JCS was nodding, but President Flaherty was giving him a hard, squinting look, and not just because of the light coming in the window from the skies over Camp David. She thought he was up to something, trying to shift blame, trying to push some kind of new agenda. Go on, she said, then remembering her manners, Dr. Harris. Four days ago, I watched kidney bean break in half, Dube said. The seven sisters became eight. Since then, we've seen a near miss that could have fractured Mr. Spinney. I would almost welcome it, said the president, if we could get rid of those ridiculous names. It'll happen, Dube said. The question is, how long does Mr. Spinney have to live, and what does that tell us? He clicked a small remote in his hand and brought up a slide on the big screen. Heads turned toward it, and he felt a mild sense of relief at not being stared at anymore by the president. The slide was a montage of a snowball rolling down a hill, a fuzzy bacterial culture growing in a petri dish, a mushroom cloud, and other seemingly unrelated phenomena. What do all these have in common? They're exponential, he said. The word gets tossed around a lot by people who use it to mean anything that's getting big fast, but it has a specific mathematical meaning. It means any process where the more it happens, the more it happens. The population explosion, a nuclear chain reaction, a snowball rolling down a hill whose speed of growth is pegged to how much it's grown. He clicked through another slide showing plots of exponential curves on a graph, then to an image of the moon's eight pieces. When the moon had only one piece, the probability of a collision was zero, he said. Because there was nothing to collide with, Pete Starling, the president's science advisor, explained. The president nodded. Thank you, Dr. Starling. When you have two pieces, why then, yes, they can collide. The more pieces you get, the higher the chances of any two pieces banging into each other. But what happens when they bang into each other? He clicked to the control again and showed a little movie of kidney beans breakup. Well, sometimes, but not always, they break in half, which means you have more pieces, eight instead of seven, nine instead of eight, and that increase in number means an increase in the odds of further collisions. It's an exponential, said the chairman. 
It occurred to me four days ago that it did have all the earmarks of an exponential process, do allowed, and we know what happens to those. President Flaherty had been watching him intently, but she now flicked her eyes over at Pete Starling, who made a dramatic upward zooming gesture with one hand, tracing the profile of a hockey stick. When an exponential hits the bend in the hockey stick curve, Doob said, the result can be indistinguishable from a detonation, or it can look like a slow, steady increase. It all depends on the time constant, the inherent speed with which the exponential thing happens, and on how we perceive it as humans. So it might be nothing, said the chairman. It could be that a hundred years will pass before we go from eight chunks to nine chunks, Doob said, nodding at him. But four days ago, I got worried that it might be one of those things that looks more like an explosion. So my grad students and I have been crunching some numbers, building a mathematical model of the process that we can use to get a handle on the time scale. And what are your results, Dr. Harris? I assume you have some or else you wouldn't be here. The good news is that the Earth is one day going to have a beautiful system of rings, just like Saturn. The bad news is that it's going to be messy. In other words, said Pete Starling, the chunks of the moon are going to keep banging into each other indefinitely and breaking up into smaller and smaller pieces, spreading out into a system of rings, but some rocks are going to fall on the ground and break things. And can you tell me, Dr. Harris, when this is going to happen, over what period of time, the president asked. We're still gathering data, tuning the model's parameters, Dube said, so my estimates could all be off by a factor of two, maybe three. Exponentials are tricky that way, but what it looks like to me is this. He clicked through to a new graph, a blue curve showing a slow, steady climb over time. The time scale at the bottom is something like one to three years. During that time, the number of collisions and the number of new fragments are going to grow steadily. What is BFR, asked Pete Star Starling, for the graph's vertical scale was labeled thus. Bolide fragmentation rate, Dube said, the rate at which new rocks are being produced. Is that a standard term, Pete wanted to know. His tone was not so much hostile as unnerved. No, Dube said. I made it up yesterday on the plane. He was tempted to add something like, I am allowed to coin terms, but didn't want things to get snarky this early in the meeting. <laughs> Seeing that Pete had been silenced, at least for a moment, Doob tried to get back into his rhythm. We'll see an increasing number of meteorite impacts. Some will cause great damage, but overall, life is not going to change that much. But then he clicked again, and the plot bent sharply upward, turning white. We're going to witness an event that I'm calling the white sky. It'll happen over hours or days. The system of discrete planetoids that we can see up there now is going to grind itself up into a vast number of much smaller fragments. They're going to turn into a white cloud in the sky, and that cloud is going to spread out. Click. The graph continued shooting upward, rocketing up into a new domain and turning red. A day or two after the white sky event will begin a thing I am calling the hard rain because not all of those rocks are going to stay up there. Some of them are going to fall into the Earth's atmosphere. He turned the projector off. This was an unusual move, but it snapped them all out of PowerPoint hypnosis and forced them to look at him. The aides in the back of the room were still thumbing their phones, but they didn't matter. By some, Dube said, I mean trillions. The room remained silent. It is going to be a meteorite bombardment such as the Earth has not seen since the primordial age when the solar system was formed, Dube said. Those fiery trails we've been seeing in the sky lately as the meteorites come in and burn up, there will be so many of those that they will merge into a dome of fire that will set aflame anything that can see it. The entire surface of the Earth is going to be sterilized. Glaciers will boil. The only way to survive is to get away from the atmosphere go underground, or go into space. Well, obviously that is very hard news if it is true, the president said. They all sat and thought about it silently for a period of time that might have been one minute or five. We will have to do both, the president said. Go into space and underground. Obviously the latter is easier. Yes, we can get to work building underground bunkers for 
and she caught herself before saying something impolitic for people to take refuge in. Dube didn't say anything. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, Dr. Harris, I'm an old logistics guy. I deal in stuff. How much stuff do we need to get underground? How many sacks of potatoes and rolls of toilet paper per occupant? I guess what I'm asking is, just how long is the hard rain going to last? Dube said, my best estimate is that it will last somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 years. <laughs> so that's the basic setup of the book. Um, the, uh, thank you. I don't know if any of you saw any of the uh, dashboard cam footage that uh, came out of the Chelyabinsk meteorite impact a couple of years ago in Russia. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about it was how bright it was. It was obviously, the light was obviously much, much brighter than the direct light of the sun. Um, and uh, a thing I found out later is that um, some of the people who were on the ground who looked up at the, the light as it came over were sunburned. So this is an event that lasted only a few moments, but during that time they were exposed to enough UV uh, to get sunburned so badly that a few days later they peeled. So what that tells you on a physics level is that the heat was such that the light coming out of that meteorite was more like the light of uh, an arc welder as compared to uh, that of a candle flame. Uh, so if you can imagine that happening all over the place, uh, it's, it's not hard to extrapolate what the results would be. So the, um, I'm not going to try to tell the whole story here. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of, of how it begins. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll mention that um, we, uh, when, when I was that kid in the bookmobile, I always uh, liked the science fiction books that had cool illustrations in them. And to a large extent, that has kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, uh, but uh, the, um, in this case, uh, uh, my publisher and I decided to kind of go the extra mile, <clears throat> and so we co-funded Weta Workshop to, um, to the, the, the special effects and concept art people down in New Zealand to uh, produce some, some concept art for the book. So we've got a front end paper and a back end paper, and we've got a color insert uh, in the middle around page 600 with a two-sided uh, full color illustration on it. Uh, that uh, helped to illustrate some of the space architecture that sort of in the long run emerges from, from this story. Uh, and in addition to that, I, I like that so much that I had them do a, an additional kind of bonus illustration, uh, which was too late for the book, but uh, we got it up on, on the web um, a, a week ago. It was up on io9 and, uh, and Gizmodo. Um, and I think it's up on the site now. So. Uh, we have we have nice pictures, is all I'm saying. Um, so other than that, I won't say more to avoid spoilers, uh, but uh, I think we could go ahead and uh, start a, a queue uh, for uh, for questions, if people have questions, uh, and uh, Anton will kind of manage that, that process, so. Nice to see you, thank you for coming and speaking. Um, tell me, did the math serve the story per se, or? Did you have independent thoughts did, on Did it? the math? Did you set up the math to fit no. the story? No, no, so, the, so uh, I, uh, it depends on what you mean, actually. So the basic scenario that I've described, there's no math behind it. There's, there's a kind of conceptual thing that you just heard in, the, in his little talk, uh, but no effort was made to actually model the fragmentation and the time scale and all that. But once the basic scenario is in place, I did uh, try to do everything else in the book on the basis of legitimate uh, sort of astrodynamics calculations. So the, there's a whole lot of orbital mechanics that shows up later in the book where these people are trying to figure out a way to boost their, the orbit of their arc and get up to a safe place. Um, and um, so I'm responsible for the numbers. So if they're wrong, it's my fault. Um, but uh, for the scenario, I got some help from uh, from people at, uh, at Planetary Resources, which is an asteroid mining company in Seattle, and from Tethers Unlimited, which is a, another company in Seattle that does sort of advanced space technology concepts. Uh, so I'm indebted to them for 
for providing some of the basic um, some of the basic ideas. Um, so I don't know if that. So the first part, no. The rest of it, yes. Uh, it's it's all supposed to be kind of legit from a uh, a, a, a mathematical standpoint. Hi. Hi. Thanks for this. So policy and the way society can do big engineering projects. You've been advocating thinking more about how science fiction can inform our imagination of society about what we do. Mm -hmm. So specifically with NASA and how it's developing new systems for exploration, what advice would you give from this book that NASA should be thinking about or what takeaways should NASA take from this, uh, this new work that you've done? Well, it's not a um, super policy-oriented kind of book, but um, I think that um, so it, it, we've got to kind of limit ourselves to almost kind of impressionistic uh, takeaways from it, and and you know one of those is um, just the sheer magnitude of the uh, the forces that we're exposed to uh, by virtue of being an object in in the the solar system and. Um, um, and how those can be used for, for bad and, and good. So it's, it's bad when an asteroid we don't know about plows in and kills people. Uh, and it's, but it's good when, when we can go out and make use of in situ resources, asteroids that are right out there for the taking. Uh, not out, we, you know, we were all taught as kids that there's this thing called the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. Where there, and indeed, there is that, and it's huge, and there's way more stuff out there than we could ever use. Um, but even if that didn't exist, the number of asteroids that are in Earth-like orbits, uh, much easier to reach than the moon, let's say, um, it, uh, is, is huge and provides us with more stuff than, than, we, than we need to, to build things. So I, I think, for, for me, if there were gonna be a, like a policy takeaway, it would have to do with the desirability of, of making use of near-Earth asteroids. Next. Hi. Um, I'd love to know if during the revision process you had other ways of destroying the Earth, and if so, what were they? <laughs> no, th this was always uh, a one-trick pony. I never had a, it's a good question, did I have a backup, uh, a backup plan? No, in this case, uh, it, it was all pretty tightly knit together. I it could not have swapped in a different uh, disaster. Good question, though. Your books are full, filled with big and little ideas. Um, my favorite little idea of yours is that little Captain Crunch eating spoon in Cryptomonocon. <laughs> I love it. I, I want it. I want it patented. Um, I was just curious, what is your favorite little idea that you've had? Oh, um, man. Little. Uh, the. Um, that's one of these things where I'm tongue tied now, but at three in the morning I'll wake up and. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, when I, when, I, when I wake up at 3 in the morning and, and know the answer, I'll, I'll tweet it. <laughs> okay. Just to Neil Stevenson, yeah. So one thing I've always really enjoyed about your books that I feel kind of puts them in, I don't know if you want to go with the label of hard science fiction, but more tending towards that is the meticulous research that's clearly involved in that. And I'm really curious about when you get these ideas, how you get started. It, you know, do you head to the library and start doing work? Do you have friends in the scientific community, or do you kind of reach out and see who yeah. out there is intrigued and talking to you? It's always different with each book. So in the case of, uh, of this one, uh, first of all, there was a really long gestation period. So, I mean, this book has been rattling around in my head for something like 10 years. And um, so during that time, I was able to, uh, I would return to it every so often and think about it and add little bits of stuff to it. Not, not to the book, but to the kind of grab bag of little files and, and notes that I had, had accumulated. And I pitched it to various people, and the process of doing that kind of helped refine it. And when I would see little bits of inf you know, interesting uh, stuff about space flight or whatever, I would kind of work that in. So by the time I actually sat down and started to write it, it was pretty fully baked. And then um, I was able to get pretty far in writing it without having to stop and do a lot of research because I'd been a just a hopeless space dork since I was like three years old. And so I've accumulated just way too much uh, detailed information about rockets and space flight and that kind of thing. Um, and so I was able to kind of wing it to a certain point. And when I felt myself reaching a point where 
I thought maybe a little bit of professional advice would be useful. Uh, I was able to reach out to people at, at places like uh, Planetary Resources and Tethers Unlimited and get uh, get some ideas from from those guys that were um, that were super helpful. So hope that kind of gives a picture of the yeah, thank process. You. Thanks. Yeah. I have a very simple question. Um, does Seven Eves take place in the same literary universe as some of your other books? I mean, are we going to see some familiar names like uh, no. Waterhouse or Chip? No. And if so, are you going to go back to that universe at some point, or do you plan to? Um, the yeah, it's a reasonable question, but this isn't an effort. To, this is a standalone thing. Uh, the um, the Shafto Waterhouse universe is one of those things that if I, you know, I, I need to stay above that event horizon, or I'll never do anything else. You know, and and that's that's because uh, I really like that universe, and I understand why it would be fun to spend the rest of my life, you know, working on, on things there. So, um, not in this case. I can't rule out that something might happen in the future that meshes with that uh, universe, but there's not a plan to, there's not a master plan at all. Yeah. So. Um, several years ago, uh, there was news that you were going to be working with, I believe it was George Clooney's production company to make mm. a Diamond Age miniseries, and mm -hmm. I think if memory serves, that was about the time of the writer's strike. Um, is anything going to happen with that, or did was that one of the many projects that fell victim to that? Uh, I, I don't know if this had anything to do with the writer's strike. I kind of suspect not, but uh, that particular option expired, and there's been no further work on it. Uh, so the uh, I think there, there is another uh, option in place now with a different outfit to... Um, to try to develop that idea. Uh, but, you know, the way it works in that business is that there's always projects like this in play, in, in development, and and uh, they uh, they sometimes go on for, well, Snow Crash has been in one stage of development or another for, for over 20 years, right? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so that's that's where we are with with that. The the the, the smokehouse, the smokehouse is Clooney's production company. That 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 didn't uh, yield uh, any results. Yeah, thanks. I have two questions. One specific and one kind of a little bit more general. I guess the first is I've already read a bit of the book, um, and I'm going to echo Anton and say one of the most enjoyable parts of reading your book because I always learn something. Um, I would say I noticed in this book it might be even a little bit more technically dense than a lot of the other books you've written. I was just wondering if that was on purpose, if you kind of went into it, or if it's just kind of the complexity of the whole space travel and moving between things and kind of the unfamiliarity of it uh, caused you to explain more than you otherwise intended. So that's part one? That's part one. The second okay. part was just okay. what your favorite book was, and that's a little bit more generic. Okay, okay. Um, the, uh, um, you have to walk a little bit of a tightrope in terms of level of technical detail. So, um, if uh, if you just wing it and write whatever you feel like writing, uh, in a way it's more difficult because you have more choices. And I think that even non-technically minded readers can sense at some level that, hey, something's up. This guy's just making stuff up. There's no there's no hard constraints here that are governing what goes on. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum is to be super technical. And, and explain everything, which you know has has its own drawbacks. So um, what I'm shooting for is kind of a, a, a nice in between place where there's enough faithfulness to technical detail that it imposes some restrictions on what I can do and on what the characters can do. So they have they can't teleport, they can't use hyperspace or anything like that. They have to deal with facts on the ground. Um, and um, associated with that, there's some little passages of technical explanation, which I've tried to make as entertaining and painless as possible. But, but people have different pain thresholds uh, <laughs> uh, for these things. But I've tried to hit the medium, the, the medium place where you could skip over all that and, and you wouldn't really miss uh, too much. And then favorite book. No, I don't have a favorite. It's it's too general. I can't I can't get any traction on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Will you tweet it if you think of one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi. Hi. On behalf of Nerds Everywhere, I just want to say thank you for your work. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, got it. It's a little. <laughs> it's a little boomy here, so I have to wait until all the echoes have oh, reached my yeah. ear before I know what you said. Uh, thank you. One question for you: How would you like? to talk to the next generation of science fiction writers. Do you have any words of advice for teenagers who might be reading you now, who are starting their first science fiction stories? Mm. Well, I guess uh, I have a pretty simple piece of advice to writers of science fiction or any other uh, kind of literature, which is to just keep writing because it's a uh, I, I think sometimes people are led to believe that it's a kind of fine art where some mysterious inspiration strikes and magic happens. But um, I think it's more like cabinet making or soccer playing, where if you do it a whole lot, you get good at it. And if you stop doing it, you, you either stop getting good at it or you actually lose ability. And so, like a, a classic mistake that I, I see people making is that they'll they'll write a book, they'll put a lot of effort into writing their first book, and then they'll stop and spend two years trying to sell their book or trying to improve their book by tiny little increments or both. Um, and the whole time that they're doing that, they're, um, they're wasting time that they could be spending writing their second book. What they should do is write their second book, and then when that fails to sell, write their third book. And <laughs> And if, if you, you know, one does actually get better, and the, the, I think that the improvement is noticeable um, and that um, eventually it, it pays off. Uh, but, uh, but I would say don't fall prey to the uh, belief that it's, a, it's magic, okay? It's just a craft, okay? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello? Hi. Hello? Sorry. Um, I had a question. The uh, a commonality of your books, especially the earlier ones, is the ending, and that they tend to end as soon as the action stops, without the more typical resolution chapter. And I was just wondering why you made that decision. Well, I don't know if I did make a decision. So <laughs> um, the um, uh, and I don't know what a resolution chapter is. I guess to me, the um, um, uh, the the if you go there there's kind of a meme that uh, <clears throat> that Stevenson can't write endings which uh, which I, I I do take issue with uh, I I, <laughs> I think if you look at um, uh, the, the I think it got started more with uh, with uh, uh, the Diamond Age which does have a kind of a hanging ending um, and. Um, and then I've seen people retroactively map it onto Snow Crash, which I find amazing because I can't imagine any ending more decisive than the ending of, of Snow Crash. And um, um, the um, um, in the case of uh, the System of the World or the whole Baroque cycle, I put a lot of effort into bringing that to a uh, to a big kind of thunderous ending. So um, the um, I, I guess I'm I'm afflicted by a kind of mental block in in conversations like this one, which is that I simply don't understand what people mean uh, when when they when they talk about it. Uh, so I've always um, um, just uh, sort of uh, um, tried to bring things to what I see as a reasonable uh, resolution. Um, the um, I guess, I guess maybe Reemdy has a, what you'd call a resolution chapter, and and they all get back to at the farm and they have a little, they have one of those, and Anathem does too. Um, so, um, but others are are different. So it's not, it's certainly not a systematic decision or anything like that. It's just. Uh, uh, me doing different things at different times and perhaps early in my career becoming bored and walking away uh, <laughs> as, as soon as I could, uh, could, could, could get away with it. But, yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you for speaking tonight and thanks for being accessible to obviously a lot of fans. Oh, sure. 
Uh, since I'm not on Twitter, I'm recalibrating. I'm not going to ask you what your favorite book is, but no pressure or no undue pressure. Just what are some good books that you've read the last several years? Thank you. Well, one that I would recommend is, is Hild by Nicola Griffith. That's H-I-L-D, uh, which is a, uh, it reads like a fantasy novel. It's a historical novel set in Britain in, I think, the seventh century. Um, and it's about the woman who became Saint Hild, so she was born a, a pagan and later became Christian and actually was was turned into a saint. Uh, it's a really interesting book because she's a seer, and um, you're reading it at first expecting some supernatural crap to break out. You're, you're thinking, okay, she's a seer, this is a fantasy novel, she's going to, like, blow somebody up, or, you know... Um, and that never happens. And what slowly becomes clear is that uh, there is no fantasy element to the book whatsoever. Uh, she's just really perceptive, and she sees things other people don't see and puts things together and, and knows what's going on in a way that other people find weird and creepy. And so they map supernatural powers onto her, and she develops uh, a kind of uh, reputation and an aura about her uh, based on that. Um, so uh, it's a really cool book. It's written largely with words that are pre-Norman words, so uh, the diction is, uh, is sort of very Anglo-Saxon. Uh, it's a big book. Um, so I, I like that quite a bit. Um, uh, uh, Austin Grossman uh, has one coming out pretty soon called, or it may be out now, called... <clears throat> I'm, I'm on a book tour, so I'm not responsible for knowing what day it is. Um, it's called Crooked, so it's a retelling of the life of Richard Nixon, um, but uh, it's it's got a kind of completely insane supernatural backstory. So, uh, um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then a, a lot of what I read isn't so much contemporary stuff as it is. Um, uh, older works by people who I think are incredibly good at writing English prose. Um, so I'm reading a Dickens book right now. He's incredibly good. Uh, Peter Fleming, the brother of Ian Fleming, uh, was fantastic. Um, he wrote a, a bunch of travel books uh, that are uh, amazingly funny and, and witty. Um, there's a guy named Patrick Lee Fermer, F-E-R-M-O-R, who was also a 30s travel writer. Uh, super gifted at, at writing good prose. So I tend to read those people as a way of kind of uh, reminding me of, of my own, uh, how, how much improvement I could do, let's say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for being here. Sure. Um, one of the types of humor I enjoy most in your books is kind of subtle commentary on modern corporate culture, trying to manage emails with lots of people on them, conference calls, contacts, and sort of the challenges of trying to get something done in an organization and the way that that can apply to even end of the world scenarios, people worrying yeah. about how a meeting is going. And so I wonder if, you, and, I, and I love that having had to deal with that myself, so I wonder um, if there's any particular personal experience that you draw on when you um, make these little asides and sort of what your oh. impressions are of trying to um, survive in a modern well, culture. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be awkward for me to uh, <laughs> answer that directly, but, um, uh, I'll, so I'll tell you a story to divert attention from your... <laughs> uh, I um, had a... Uh, I was approached once by um, a, a big company that wanted me to work on a game, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it. So I, um, I suggested they talk to another... A friend of mine who's a novelist who's um, very gifted because I thought he could... Uh, he could nail it. And um, so he got involved with this company. And um, he went to uh, a certain city to, to meet in a certain conference room with a certain company to um, have his first, it was in, in his life, it was his first meeting, right? And because um, he had always just been a solo novelist until then. And he called me up right after the meeting, and he was in a state of, like, existential horror. He was just, like, <laughs> almost ready to, to, to kill himself. And 
and it, I, I was, it was hard to calm him down, but he was babbling on and on about something called power plus or plus point or <laughs> some something that he had never seen until that moment. And you know, he was he. Uh, I said, well, it's called PowerPoint. He said, yes, that's it. <laughs> you know what? what you know, I, I I explained to him that it was. Um, for, for people who can't communicate, it's what a dialysis machine is for, <laughs> for people who don't have kidneys. Um, and, um, and then he got, oh, okay. And then that totally calmed him down and everything was fine after that. So um, it, I, I, I would say it doesn't take a lot of exposure to that to get the idea and to, to you know, be able to make fun of it in a, a novel. Thanks. Um. Hi, Neil. Thanks for coming and talking with us. Sure. Um, the top Amazon review for your book right now is titled Elon Musk and Neil deGrasse Tyson Save the World. Can, can, can what and Neil deGrasse? Elon Musk and Neil deGrasse oh, okay, Tyson okay, Save okay. the World. And I think that must be somewhat deliberate as you have two characters in Seven Eves who resemble these two to a degree. Um, I think Doc Dubois is, is a head-on Neil deGrasse Tyson, Sean Probst maybe, maybe not as much. But I was wondering, is there anyone else in your book who was inspired by someone we might know? Anybody you want to own up to? No, I, I try to avoid uh, direct uh, knockoffs, you know, as much as possible. So there's no, like, hidden... And the reason is that it leads to people, like, trying to figure out the secret key, which, you know, I... <laughs> I, I, I don't think is a super uh, productive uh, way to read a book. So no, it's, there, there's, no um, there's, there's nothing like that uh, going on. I'm, uh, to the contrary, I, I try to pretty much avoid it. So. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um. Thanks. Um, I adore your endings um, <laughs> as much as I love the rest of the books. Uh, I have a thousand questions, but I'll confine myself to one kind of complicated one. Okay. Um, a lot of novelists talk about um, characters kind of growing in the process of writing and changing. Uh, you seem like a, a, a I don't want to, you, you seem like always in control, so to speak, and um, I'm interested uh, in the context of, of Seven Eves especially because um, the personalities and characteristics of, of seven of those characters are so important to the stories. Um, if it happened in that book, um, if, and by it, I mean the kind of process where a character kind of diverges from what you might have planned uh, or changes, like the, um, any characters get the imp of the perverse on them. Um, and I guess lastly, just kind of somewhat related, um, without giving too much away, what tribe, in Seven Eves would uh, novelists belong to? Oh, cool question. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure I got the, the first part of your question. I think you're asking, um, were there instances in Seven Eves where a character went a direction I hadn't expected? OK. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds to me like you've read the book. Most of it. OK. Um, I would say that Julia becomes more interesting than we expect her to be. Um, I would say uh, other people sort of came out of nowhere. Um, Aida came out of nowhere. Uh, but that's, that's all good. I mean, the, um, there's <clears throat> you sort of need, uh, I think, a mix of, of characters who do what you expect them to do and ones who suddenly veer off and turn into someone else, and ones who just show up un unbidden uh, and make themselves at home in your book. And um, the, um, I think a, a big part of the process of, of learning to write books and you know, getting better at writing books is, is learning how to accommodate those events and not, not, not fight back against them, because normally, it, you know, normally it's something good. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I tend to avoid uh, doing really strict outlining of, uh, of books ahead of time or deciding how it's all going to come out because that doesn't allow the, the wiggle room for, for those kinds of, of things to happen. Um, so uh, 
Okay, second part was what uh, tribe would, would novelists belong to? Um, this is going to make no sense to people who haven't read the book, but um, um, probably Julian's and Moirans. Um, Thanks. Be, be the Moirans, because you sort of turn into a different person with each project. Okay, thanks. So you may have heard that the Museum of Science Fiction is planned to open here in D.C. over the next few years. Oh, uh, no, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, but they're doing, I think, a preview this year and then a full museum, I think, 2018 is what they're And does that for. have any connection with the, the, one, the, the, the one in Seattle or no? No, it's okay. an independent. Okay. Yeah. So one of their goals is to uh, support a revival of science fiction that inspires positive imagination. Mm. So when you're writing your um, novels, do you put any thought into how you will influence or inspire future technology? You know, uh, <coughs> hieroglyph is a special case because it was consciously designed to do exactly that. So I have to set that one aside. But in general, I think um, writing a book with an agenda in mind uh, is probably a mistake. Um, it uh, usually doesn't work. And people can sense at some level that it's an, an ax grinder. Um, and um, and when they sense that, there's a tendency to, to tune it out. Um, so um, um, I, I think that uh, like the there's an indirect way of going about that, which is to just uh, bring to light uh, interesting things that uh, the reader may not have been exposed to, um, and to uh, um, to sort of make that interesting by putting it into a good story. And, uh, um, and so I think that can indirectly lead to some of the good effects that you're, you're talking about. Um, but it's got to be organic. It's got to emerge from, from things that happen in the story that, uh, that feel like they belong there and decisions made by the characters that seem like decisions that real people would make. Uh, and and I, I think that, that if that's all done right, it can sort of uh, it can have those effects, but it's not in a, a causative sort of point A to point B kind of manner. Okay, thanks. We have the last question. With no pressure to me. Yeah. Uh, as a novelist, do you go back and re-explore uh, some of your previous work just in your imagination? I was wondering, if you do, where do you set yourself, where do you imagine yourself in your in your books? Do you see yourself as a character, do you see yourself in any of the universes? Are you Victorian? Oh. Well, um, that's an interesting question. I, I sort of generally don't, um, but uh, I mean, on one level, I'm, I'm kind of in all of those characters. Um, so uh, um, the, uh, you know, if I had to pick one of those eras that, that was most fascinating, it would be the era of the, the Baroque cycle, which is um, unbelievably complex and sort of vulgar and fascinating um, in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, uh, but no, there's not like a direct uh, mapping of, of me into those, uh, into those spaces. Good question, though. Thank you. So there's going to be a, um, there's, there's two things that are going to happen now. One is that I'm going to go somewhere else and sign books, uh, and there will be a system set up to allow for personalizations uh, within reason. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and not my department, but I'm going to stand somewhere and sign books. And then the other activity that we're going to have is going to be a raffle of some swag that the publisher uh, supplied. So maybe we'll let Anton um, so kind of explain. stick around for a moment, and um, then you can go out to the lobby and we'll form an organized line and you'll sign some books. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yep, thanks. <laughs>